Hello, okay. everyone, and uh, welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted uh, to talk to Professor Muqtada Khan. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. Uh, I am a big fan of your uh, blogging theology, and I'm absolutely delighted to be on it. Well, that's, uh, thank you very much indeed. Now, Professor Muqtada Khan has kindly agreed to do a presentation on his latest book, Islam and Good Governance, a Political Philosophy of Islam. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Muktikar Khan is Professor of Islam and International Affairs at the University of Delaware in the USA. He is the Academic Director of the State Department's National Security Institute at uh, the Institute for Global Studies at the University of Delaware. Uh, he was a senior fellow of the Brookings Institution. They've got an amazing website, by the way. I do recommend have a look at that. A fellow of the Al-Walid Center at Georgetown University and a fellow of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. He is also the host of Conversations on YouTube and he tweets at Muqtada Khan. And you can get a copy of of his book on Amazon. Now, I will link to all of these in the description below. So you can just click on the link to go to his book and to his uh, tweets and to his YouTube channel. So, Professor Khan, would you like to introduce us to your book, Islam and Good Governance, A Political Philosophy of Islam? Well, thank you very much. And uh, salam alaikum and greetings of thank peace you. to all your listeners. Uh, this is the book called Islam and Good Governance. Uh, the cover is a very famous uh, Mughal miniature in which uh, Sufi scholars are giving advice to, to the Mughal emperor. So my book is also a kind of advice to rulers. Uh, to give you a little background about the purpose of the book, uh, I, I have many objectives uh, for which I try to fulfill. One of the things is to contribute to Islamic political philosophy, to, to move it forward. Uh, the second thing that I wish to do is that there is a very famous tradition of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he says that Allah has commanded that we do ihsan in everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded ihsan in everything. And then he goes on to talk about it. Even when you're sacrificing animals, uh, make sure that you do it with ihsan. Uh, there are many ways to understand the term ihsan, as you will uh, realize after my presentation. But I follow William Chittick's translation in English, uh, which is to say, to do beautiful things. Most traditional scholars translate it as uh, to do good deeds, uh, which is completely lost. Because uh, if you say, amal salihin, which are also virtuous, virtuous and good deeds. And then there is a concept in the Quran called Al-Bir. Uh, it's in the 177th verse of the second chapter. Maybe you should just read it as one of your shorts later, 2.177. Uh, and in that, God talks about what is Al-Bir. Uh, and then you can talk about al ihsan So in my mind, the hierarchy of virtue is Amal, Salihin, Al-Bir, and Ahsan is at the peak. So to translate all three as good deeds, you have lost a lot. Uh, and, and therefore, I prefer to use uh, Chitik's uh, translation of the term, which is to say, Al-Ahsan is to do beautiful things, to do beautiful deeds. And mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has therefore commanded us to do beautiful things in every sphere. Allah kulli shay. So my question then is, uh, why not in politics? So why do we allow realism and real politic to dominate our domestic and foreign policies? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to do uh, beautiful things in every aspect of life, why not in statecraft too? That is one prompt question. The second question is that um, uh, before the... I consider one of the few last... Uh, people left on earth who still feels that Islamic values have a lot to contribute to governance, especially after Ranushi abandoned it. So I, I joke about it that after Ranushi, I'm the only one left. Of course, there are lots of people who want Islamic values in the political arena. 
but what kind of Islamic values uh, is is the question, and which of these values would we have the most beautiful of manifestations in the political arena? That is the second question, which prompts to write the book. The third, uh, and I think this is the most important thing, is that uh, until I saw what the Muslim Brothers did in Egypt in that one year before they were ousted and treated very brutally by the current regime. Uh, I was not very pleased with the way they tried to govern, and neither was I pleased with uh, the way the Islamists were playing politics in Tunisia. And I, I had this horrible realization that they're just other, just another kind of politics. Uh, you know, this is not transformative. This is not, uh, from a value perspective, very inspirational. Uh, so I did look very critically at their ideas and their ideology, and I did write a piece for the Middle East policy, identifying five areas in which the Muslim Brotherhood need to rethink uh, their approach to governance. And from there on, I got involved in this, and this hadith particularly prompted me to examine, and, and then I realized what an amazing, amazing concept the concept of Ahsan really is in the Quran. And then I decided to basically follow the logic of the hadith. If we were to bring Hassan in politics, in political philosophy, how would it be? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is uh, the background for writing this book. The book has basically, uh, so I think I will, uh, with your permission, I will try and use a PowerPoint so that I can, it will keep me constrained and okay. also keep me <laughs> so can you see the oh yeah very good yeah very clear yeah. so 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 this is the book and these are the particulars that are going to be established so on the next slide you can this is the structure of my argument in the book so in the first three chapters so the first is introduction this i basically told you what is in the introduction so in the introduction i talk about uh, how I came about Hassan, and in the second and third chapters, I essentially make the case, uh, and there are these two examples. I take two case studies. One is what I call a very mundane and non-controversial, non-contestable issue. What would happen? What is the, how do you remedy when you break your fast in the month of Ramadan by having sex with your wife? So you're fasting and you can't control yourself and you have sex with your wife and then you, your fast is broken. How do you compensate for it? Uh, and so I go into the nitty gritties of how the, the, the Islamic law has come up with a, a remedy. It's called kufara in Arabic. How do you compensate for something? Uh, and, uh, and then I also look at the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. And I'm not looking at the law, I'm but f- very familiar with the genealogy of the law uh, and the role uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the British have pay- played in, in, in actually passing the law. All of that is fine, but I focus on the theological and philo- uh, juristic justification for blasphemy by Muslim theologians, Muslim fuqaha today. So in the last five, 10 years, how did they do it? Especially in the case of Asia Bibi, the Christian woman who was sentenced, who was accused of blasphemy. And then the governor, Salman Tasir, was assassinated and so on. So in that particular case study, I look at the, the juristic argument. So I take both the cases and I conclude that it seems to appear as if that Islamic jurists look at the Quran and then look at the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his precedents. They put them together and then take out everything that is compassionate, merciful, and beautiful from it. And what is left, they say this is Islamic law. So they come out with the harshest and the least compassionate interpretation of the two sources in articulating the law. And that is very clearly manifest in the way the blasphemy law is justified there. Okay, one can argue that it is a political issue, it's extremely contentious, the ulama really don't care what this labor was, has to say, they're more using the blasphemy law to push back against liberalism, to push back against Western ideology, and they have basically drawn a line uh, in the sand saying, this is it, beyond this, we will not allow Western liberalism to undermine Islamic culture, except in Pakistan. So I understand that logic and I identify that, et cetera. 
but nevertheless, they are also advancing theological arguments. I, I, I'm willing to accept that political argument that we are making. This is our last stand against Western cultural and intellectual imperialism on the issue of blasphemy. Fine. But when they start using Islamic methodology, etc., then I have a problem with that because it ends up excluding Assam. I don't know, Paul, whether you have ever attended a, a Friday khutbah. But if you do, uh, and if you listen to the Arabic part of it, I guarantee you that in most parts of the world, uh, well, I'm above 50, so I would have heard 50 into 50, over 2,500 khutbahs uh, in my life. That's quite a few. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I must have remembered at least. So I cannot remember all, but I can tell you that maybe 90% of the sermons, the, the last sentence that the, the, the imam will say before he announces that let's pray, he would read this ayah from the Quran. Then, uh, it is, Inna laha, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Inna laha ya'muru bil adli wal ahsan, wa yitaid al-qurba, wa yanha al-fahishai, wa al-munkar, wa al-baghiya, izakum la allakum tazakkaroon, and then he'll say, wa qimu salah, and we stand up for prayer. So the first part of the verse is, Inna laha ya'muru bil adli wal ahsan. It says that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded Hassan with justice. Inna Allah ya'amru bil adli wal ahsan. So I remember when I was writing this book and uh, I also give Friday sermons sometimes and every Friday sermon I recite that. <laughs> One day I was finishing my sermon and I recited this verse and I was you know, stunned by that moment of epiphany. I said, oh my God. God wants Hassan with justice. So all this talk of creating Islamic Sharia and imposing Shari Islamic Sharia and Islamic State to achieve justice is missing the point. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran, justice is not enough. I want Hassan with justice. This is in the Quran. Uh, I'm not concocting it. And if you look at the interpretations and translations, everyone says the same thing. Allah yamaru Hassan. So it was very funny. Someone had to actually physically <laughs> shake me and say, come on, let's pray. <laughs> because I was still standing on the member, like thinking about this verse. And, uh, and I realized at that moment that uh, justice is not enough. Justice is not enough. Uh, we need to do ihsan. And there are, the Quran is full of, there's about 170 plus verses which have different conjugates of the the, uh, the hasana, uh, so you will find Mohsin, Husn, Husna, etc. in the Quran, more than 170 verses. Uh, and even when God talks about divorce, he says divorce, but divorce with Ahsan, be beautiful in how you even divorce and you participate. Uh, a friend of mine, when he heard about this, and then he heard this verse in the Quran about showing Ahsan in divorce, uh, he told me that uh, after he read this, he felt he was going through a divorce and he didn't know how to do Ahsan in divorce. So he asked his former wife what she would be doing after the divorce. And she said, I'm going to start some company or something. So he presented her with a brand new Apple laptop wow. as a parting gift over wow. and above the financial settlement. Right? So he showed Ahsan in this. I was so pleased with that, brother. I said, you are a true Mohsin. Amazing. At least in this moment. So, yeah. So, so that is the, the point uh, that I do in the first three, two chapters. In, in the third chapter, I, I do a genealogy of Islamic political movements and this call for Islamic revival, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Jamaat Islami, etc. Hmm. Uh, there's a very nuanced discussion of their political ideas. The whole third chapter is about it, looking at it from all the way from Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and Jamal Abdin Afghani to, to Hanushi today. And uh, there are lots of conclusions that I've drawn, but one of the things that I think that this has done is made Islam an identity, a political identity in many ways. So people want to use Islam not as a source of values, which will inform their thinking and their actions, but an identity that needs to be defended. Uh, and uh, I found that quite problematic uh, from a philosophical perspective. Uh, so, so that is my critique of, of what Western scholars would call as political Islam. 
And then in chapter four and five, what I do is, in chapter four, I basically review everything classical and contemporary that's been written about Ahsan. I look at Ahsan in the Quran. I look at Ahsan in the Hadith. Uh, I look at uh, classical scholars, contemporary scholars. I look at how even in when doing tafsir in the Quran, how people have politicized the use of Ahsan. This tension between Sufis and non-Sufis have crept into the tafsirs also. So if you read, so I do a case study of looking at some verses of the Quran and see how many different commentators have interpreted them. And I find that the spectrum is from Ibn Arabi to Ibn Taymi, uh, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Kasir. Uh, and Ibn Kasir's interpretations of terms like Mahsin, etc., seems to anticipate mystical and Sufi interpretations of Ahsan and seeks to block them. You can see that very clearly. He is doing like a preemptive <laughs> blocking of uh, Sufi interpretations of Ahsan. I found that uh, interesting and troubling. And then I found some very profound interpretations uh, from uh, Ibn Arabi. And then in the last section, uh, the six to eight chapters, I talk about, you know, in the fifth chapter, I do a second reading of Ahsan. This is my reading of Ahsan. The whole chapter is about how I see Ahsan. And you will see this in a slide today. And then from chapter six to eight, I talk about how we can try and implement. You must, and I want all your listeners also to acknowledge that this is an aspirational Thing. I, I don't think we can realize the state of Ahsan because it, it anticipates a high degree of virtue. Uh, I myself cannot <laughs> demonstrate <laughs> Ahsan on a daily basis in my life, even though I've advocated the book and I feel that the book has transformed me. But I do small, small things. Like, for example, when I go to play tennis at my club, in the indoor club, uh, people sometimes leave balls behind. Uh, and uh, after writing this book, I feel that I cannot walk, leave the club without picking all the balls and putting them where they ought to be. This is a little bit of an example of Ahsan. And I know the day I walk away for no reason uh, than that day I have not tried to live as a Mahasin. And then it becomes much more difficult in interpersonal interactions where you have, are supposed to be have beautiful conduct. For me, that is a challenge, uh, subduing your personal arrogance and, and on, so on and so forth. So it's a jihad al-Akbar, you know, trying to strive to live a life by Ahsan. But in the public policy arena, I feel that it is important for us to benchmark what a beautiful policy would be. Mm -hmm. So if President Biden tells me, Mr. Khan, uh, so you wrote a book on Ahsan, what is the most beautiful way we're dealing with racism in America? What is the most beautiful way we're dealing with immigration challenges? And I want to articulate a policy position which is profoundly sympathetic, compassionate, that will please uh, one who is Rahman and Rahim, one who is most benevolent and most merciful. He would be happy with that. And then I would understand that um, like our country can't afford that. <laughs> or if we do that, we may not. So let's find a middle ground. But the point is that by benchmarking what is beautiful, when people implement less than beautiful policies, I want them to feel guilty. And I want them to be cognizant of the fact that I'm not able to do the best thing possible. It's like this. Let's say that somebody comes to me and asks me for help. And let's say that I'm capable of giving them $100 as help. And if I give them $100 as help, that is good. But if I decide, okay, for the, he needs more than that. So you know what I'm going to do? Next whole month, I'm not going to go to Starbucks and not have this $4 coffee that I drink. And so now I will give him $220 instead. So what I save from this is sacrifice. This is a Hassan. But if I'm capable of giving him $100 and I give him $10, and I'm just a loser. <laughs> so, so, so the point that I want to make is that when someone even gives $100, which is their capability, I want them to feel a little bit more guilty that, oh, we could have, you know, made a little bit of sacrifice. And if you're doing only 10, I want you to be ashamed of yourself <laughs> that you could go up to 220, but you're giving only 10. So that is the point of this whole book. I don't think 
that there will be a mass movement in the Muslim world demanding that Hassan be institutionalized in the political sphere. But I do want a small group of Muslim in, in the civil society. It's like human rights activists, right? They are constantly, you know, against the struggling with national interest. So they are articulating and saying, oh my God, all these poor refugees coming from Syria, let's bring them all in, let's give them citizenship, let's give them all the rights and then even provide something. And the governments usually cannot afford to do this. There's a struggle and balance. Whatever the policy is made, at least the human rights activists are art articulating what, in my view, would be the role of a Muslim if he was dealing with this situation. So that is how I discuss uh, the political philosophy. I have a slide which will also explain the third part of it. But coming to the fundamental source of Hassan is, uh, is the first hadith in the collection Sahih Muslim. And this is a very beautiful hadith. I'm sure all Muslim, most, most Muslims have heard about this hadith. Uh, I deal with it in detail. I have the Arabic text and the English translation in the book. Uh, you can see that in chapter uh, four in the beginning. So I will summarize very briefly. There is this a gathering in the, uh, in the Prophet Sallallahu mosque and he's sitting and talking to his companions and a stranger walks in. Uh, there are many companions. The, 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 the mosque is sort of full. They, they look at him. Nobody recognizes him. He's a total stranger. They think he's a traveler, but they're surprised that he's wearing spotless white clothes. Mm -hmm. And they are wondering that how come a traveler who has come from somewhere else that none of, none of us can recognize, uh, why are his clothes so spotless? Um, in the prayer, when you sit, we, we have a position called Jalsa where we sit down after two units of prayer. So the Prophet used to sit in that position. So this man then walks straight up to the Prophet and also sits facing the Prophet with his knees nearly touching the knees of the Prophet. You see upon him. So close. <laughs> when I first read this, I was wondering, oh my God, the security was so bad <laughs> that all these companions let this stranger walk all the way to the Prophet and sit. And so this man sits there and then he asks the Prophet, Islam. Tell me about Islam. And the Prophet answers the question, and then that's where the five pillars of Islam come. Uh, and there's also another hadith about Bunyal uh, Islam ala khamsa. So these are the two sources from which we get this idea that these are the five pillars of Islam. The Prophet answers the question, and the man then says, Sadhata, you're right. He's as if he's correcting the Prophet. <laughs> you get full grades. And then the Prophet, he asks the Prophet, what is Iman? And the Prophet answers the question. Uh, and then he, the fourth question is, when is the end of times? And the Prophet says, neither you who is asking the question nor me knows, only God knows when the end of times, the Qiyamah is coming. Then the, the stranger asks the fifth question as to what are the signs of, uh, of Qiyamah and the Prophet Sallallahu answers to what the signs are. And they're very interesting. I would ask your readers to go read them. Uh, one of the signs apparently are that uh, the Bedouin of the desert would be competing in building the tallest buildings. And you can Amazing. see now the contest yeah. between Sa <laughs> Saudi Arabia and Dubai. <laughs> Yeah, it is quite possible. It's pretty much around the corner. But the third question is what this book is all about. Uh, and this person asks uh, the Prophet, what is Hassan? And the answer that the Prophet gave, gave uh, peace and blessings upon him is mind-blowing. He says, Allah tarahu fa illam takun tarahu innahu yirak. He says that Hassan is to worship Allah as if you see him. Hassan is to worship Allah as if you see him. And if you cannot see him, then know that he sees you. Now, if you read all the verses in the Quran about Hassan, you get the sense that Hassan is something very beautiful, something that is going to please God so much that if you do Hassan, he's going to do Hassan to you. Uh, he's going to go, Hassan is to go well beyond the call of duty. That's what it is. Hassan is to go well beyond the call of duty. And so God will be just limitless in his rewards to those. But one who's seeking Hassan would not be interested in the reward. He won't be doing it for the reward either. But, but in this hadith, you get a very different understanding of what Hassan is. Hassan is 
to worship Allah as if you see him. The Arabic word ta'abudu can also be translated as to serve Allah as if you see him. So ahsan is to serve Allah or worship Allah as if you see him. And if you cannot see him, then know that he's watching you. So there are very profound implications which can be drawn. Uh, for a long time, I was very puzzled about it. So if you are familiar with the, the night journey of the Prophet, peace be upon him, which is called Miraj. He went into the heavens and met with other prophets, went to Jerusalem al-Quds and prayed with other prophets, where he led the prayers. So he is often described as Imam al-Anbiya, the Imam of the prophets. He goes up into the heavens where he addresses Moses and uh, Jesus as brothers and addresses Abraham and Adam as father. And then there is this moment where he goes beyond a point where nobody can go and he goes beyond this point. There are disagreements among the companions as to what happened after that. The minority opinion following Ibn Abbas عنه, is that he did indeed see and converse with God. And uh, when Muslims stop and read At-Tahiyat in the prayer, at lillahi wa salwatu wa tayyibatu, when they read that whole thing, that is the summary of the dialogue between Prophet Muhammad and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you read the English translation, you will immediately see that it's the dialogue. So it, the Prophet is speaking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking, and his angels are also speaking in that At-Tahiyat. So... Uh, so, if you go with that position, there's also a verse in Surah Al-Najm, which says that he saw the greatest of his signs, uh, which uh, traditional scholars tend to say, oh, he saw Jibril. I beg to differ. Jibril is great, but he's not the greatest sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. To me, Prophet Muhammad is the greatest sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This entire creation is a greater sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mercy and the love that we witness in the world are greater signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically what that verse tells me from Surah Al-Najm is that Prophet essentially witnessed some aspects of God some of his greatest signs he was able to see. And so when he comes back to earth, when he prays, he can pray as if he's seeing Allah. So when he says, Ahsan is antabudu Allah ka to worship Allah as if you see him, it is not <laughs> metaphorical. It is literal in his case. And for us, it is aspirational. I mean, none of us is going to get a journey. The Burak is not coming to pick us up. It's not like calling Uber, calling Burak, come take me. No, it's not going to happen. Yeah, the, the angel of death is going to come one day and he will take us, <laughs> but not Burak. So for us, uh, this Miraj will only be metaphorical and spiritual. It is our Tuskia and Nafs, our struggle to purify our soul. So Ibn Taymiyyah, in his Kitab al-Iman, described uh, this hadith, uh, you know, at the end, when the man goes away, the, uh, the prophet turns and tells his companions that that was Archangel Gabriel, Gabriel who came to teach you your deen. Mm. That's why, to me, deen is accumulation. He came to teach you your deen. Uh, so, Ibn Taymiyyah says, these are darajat. He talks of them as stages. Uh, I have an academic disagreement. I don't think it is stages. Islam is a ritual aspect of our belief, except for the first part. So the four, the second, third, the fourth, and fifth elements of the five pillars are rituals. The first one is a belief. Iman is all about belief. It's about our heart. And Hassan is to basically transcend uh, and go far beyond uh, what is expected of you. Uh, and therefore, neither is possible, neither Islam or Iman, uh, Ahsan is possible without Iman. First, you have faith in that. And that's why maybe uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's book is on Kitab al-Iman. So, to, to fast forward, I identify Ahsan and split it into these seven or eight elements. I club Muraqaba and Muhasaba. So Ahsan, I'm not going to talk about each one of them. It'll take an hour or more. <laughs> In the book, there are more than 10, 15 pages on each element. I'll just roughly touch. Uh, 
So the mushahada is the first one, the most important, to bear witness. And if you look at antahbudu allaha ka'anna katarahu, the relationship between the believer and the beloved is very profound. If you're saying that pray, serve, I describe it as living life as if you have made eye contact with God. To, to be in a state of Ahsan. Ahsan is a mis- mystical condition. To be in that state is as if you have made eye contact with God. So it is to worship, to serve, to do things as if you have made eye contact with God. And if you're not able to do that, he's looking at you. So, so God is both the witness and the witness. He's witnessing us. That's how he's watching us. He's looking at us. And he is the one that we seek to witness. Our life is to bear witness to the Lord. All the monotheistic religions talk about it. In, in Hinduism, I think the concept of darshan is very close to this, that you're seeking darshan of God. Uh, when Moses went into the desert in the Quran, he says he prayed, Rabbi arini unzur ilaika, O Lord, show thyself so that I may gaze upon you. And if you know uh, Rabia, the famous Sufi poetess, her poem was also this, that her desire was to gaze upon Allah. This is what is the ultimate desire of Ahsan is to gaze. So one element of, of living life uh, through Ahsan is to bear witness to God. Uh, and you have to find ways to do that. And one way to do that could be to serve others, etc. The second element is murahaba and muhasaba. Murahaba is to be self-critical and to be uh, someone who, and muhasaba is to take account of yourself. So basically, you, it is like Socrates said, a life unexamined is unworthy, unworthy of living, right? So basically, you examine your own self, but from a normative and critical uh, ethical position. Have I been a good person today? Have I done something wrong today? Have I done something to displease Allah? And have I done something to please Him? So you, in, in terms of institutional terms, uh, you could say that uh, we have a very self-critical society, a society that is very self-critical of itself. And people are then asking questions about whether we can uh, do murakhaba or muhasaba institutional. And we can talk about that a little later. Then husn, husn is beauty. God wants us to do everything beautiful and Muslims have historically done a great job of it. If you look at Islamic architecture, it is stunningly beautiful. The most beautiful building in the world is the Taj Mahal uh, uh, designed and built by the same people who built the Blue Mosque um, in Turkey. You can see Islamic calligraphy and, and so on. So there is profound beauty that Muslims have tried uh, to bring about. So the, the, the beauty that you see, the physical beauty that you see in the Muslim world is a, a commentary on this, this particular concept, uh, element of Ihsan. And then is, of course, mercy and compassion. And, and uh, they, I have an extended discussion about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to one tradition, says that before he created creation, he wrote a note to himself saying, let my mercy prevail over my wrath. So this creation that you see is a consequence. It is, shall we say, a reality in which God's mercy is hegemonic. The creation is a reality in which God's mercy is hegemonic and God's anger and wrath is uh, subdued. That is itself God doing a hand in my view, that is God's ahsan upon us, that he has shackled his uh, wrath and unleashed his mercy upon us. So there's more to mercy. There's mercy that we can show, the mercy we can. The reason why suicide is considered haram is because it is despair from the mercy of Allah and so on. So for a lot of extensive discussions. Uh, I also think that love is a fundamental part of Ihsan. In the Quran, God says uh, he loved them and they loved him. And the Sufis latch upon this hours and talk extensively about how God loved us first. And uh, there is a very well-known tradition among Sufis that comes from Ibn Arabi, which has two forms. One is that I was a hidden treasure who wanted to be known and therefore... I created the creation to be known. So he created sentient beings like you and me so so that we could know him. Uh, 
And then there is another version of it which says that I was a hidden treasure. I wanted to be loved. And so I created creation so that the creation may love me. Uh, the traditional scholars uh, say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghani. One of his attributes is ghani. Ghani means one who has no need. And so they reject this particular tradition, saying that God is in not, neither in need of, uh, of uh, being known, nor is he in need of being loved. So they reject it, but the Sufis embrace this tradition. And so for them, the whole purpose of creation is this love affair between us and God. That is what this whole creation is all about, this love affair be, between the lover and the beloved. And once you achieve that status, uh, and there are many traditions, Ahadis or Qudsi, uh, in which so one I like very much is in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you take one step towards me, I will take four steps towards you. If you walk towards me, I will run towards you. Uh, and if you think about me, I will think about you. If you mention me in a company of people, like I'm mentioning him mm -hmm. uh, in your company today, then he will mention my name in the company of a more superior assembly. So when I say Allah in front of you, I'm assuming that Allah is saying, Ya Muqtadir in front of angels. So this is Ihsan. This is my love affair with God. So that is what Mahabba is. Marifa is, is a very important aspect. There is a verse in the Quran. Uh, let me, give me one second. Uh, can you see this? Yeah, we see it fine. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman yeah. Yes. So the, the ayah is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah zina yastamiyuna al-qawl fattabiyuna ahsanahu. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this Quran is those who listen to the word of Allah and follow the best meaning in it. Hmm. They are the ones who God has guided, and they are the ones who have understanding. Well, so even when it comes to... Ask, inter sorry, what, what, is it an ayah of the Quran, is it, that you've just quoted? It is an ayah in the Quran. Did you know which yeah. one it is? Is that of interest? Let me give you an example. I think it's 39.18, but uh, uh, let me just be very specific. Uh, uh, the verse, uh, epistemology, uh, 39.18, yeah. Yes, I'm just reading it in, in my Quran 13. Uh, translation. Yeah, uh, who listen to what is said and follow what is best. These are the ones God has guided. These are the people of understanding. Yeah. Yes. So, so I took a look at this verse, and to me, this verse says that even in our in the manner in which we understand the epistemology that we deploy uh, should have should be. I don't want to use the word painted, but should be influenced by a sand. Uh, so we should anticipate beauty. We should err on the side of, uh, if you have different meanings, we should privilege the most beautiful meaning, which means God is also acknowledging that his sources can be interpreted in less than beautiful ways. So he said that true people who have true understanding, the people I have guided are the ones who are going to extract uh, the beautiful meanings of uh, Ahsan. So in that sense, Ahsan is also to me a marifa or an epistemology. And finally, Hassan is Fana. Fana is to submit yourself to the will of Allah to the point that you don't exist. So when the Prophet Muhammad, if he saw God, he saw God and he wouldn't exist at that moment because the glory of God is so infinite that nothing else exists uh, in his wake. And that's why probably we don't have any descriptions. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Laisaka misfited, nothing like him. There, that's, there's no way I can talk to you about God because if you ask me, Muqtada, how is Delaware? And I can say, well, Delaware is like, <laughs> you know, it is like this or that. How is Texas? Oh, Texas is like Germany. Big. It's like Saudi Arabia, actually, religious and full of oil. <laughs> so, no, I say so that. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a comparative, right? But when we talk about God, we cannot say God is like this or like that because there's nothing like him so one of the i think uh, 
profound tragedies of human existence is we will never really know God until we know God. <laughs> so, and so until we reach the state of Ahsan, we will never know God. And once we reach the state of Ahsan, we will cease to exist uh, as a separate ego. Uh, so fana is the elimination of the self, annihilation of the self. Uh, and there are many places in, in Surah Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu man alayha fan. Everything that exists will perish. And what will remain essentially is uh, the majestic and glorious face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, that is the destiny of creation is essentially perish. It will perish and return to Allah. That's why when people die, we say, uh, wa inna ilayhi rajiun, that indeed they belong to Allah and they have returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything belongs to Allah and we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, so that is what is happening. We perish in order to become one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is fana. So this is my unpacking of Ahsan. This is mostly the entire fifth chapter. This is milk. When the Prophet ﷺ went on Miraj, mm. Jibril offered him wine, milk, and water, and he chose to drink milk. An interesting question. Wine is halal in heaven, so why didn't he pick it up? Because even though he was there, he was from here at that time. So, so it was still forbidden on him <laughs> in the heaven. That is how some scholars have explained to me. Uh, yeah, so... I don't want to talk about a lot of how these things are evolving, but the question now is how do we implement all of this? How do you implement mercy and forgiveness? So in public policy, you could argue that parole for prisoners, bankruptcy laws, forgiveness for crimes committed, uh, forgiveness for people who make error and then repent, all of this can be instituted in society. Today, our societies are becoming very really unforgiving, uh, and uh, which is not a good thing. I think, and, I think there's and, a, a, a case, uh, if I can just give it an example, not, not for myself so much, but you know, say a, a well-known public personality, a politician, a, a celebrity, um, you know, it's discovered that 10 years, 20 years ago, they tweeted something which by today's standards is unacceptable. You know, I won't go into details, but say they just uh, about a particular group of people that by today's standards is unacceptable. Uh, often is the case in America and here and in many places in Europe. But that person not only, of course, expresses a great regret and repentance, but they're, they're deplatformed. Their career can be destroyed. Oh, yeah. their, their, their integrity is, is fundamentally doubted and called into question for something that happened years ago. I'm just giving this as a very... It's not a, not, a, not a trivial example of a contemporary example of a lack of forgiveness uh, that our society shows to people who, whose uh, a fault is uncovered for many years ago and they're still not forgiven. It's, it's even as if there's no forgiveness anymore. Yeah, and you know, this is such a strange phenomenon because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even if your sins are higher than the mountains, I will forgive you. Just ask for forgiveness. I mean, he is Many of his names and attributes are about forgiveness. And unfortunately, we are creating a society which is very short on forgiveness. And even the people who play roles in creating this society, they, they themselves are, as you say, hung by their own petard. <laughs> so the, the phrase, you know, so, so everyone is, there is an absence of that. So, so one of the discussion is how do we create a state or a, a society that will will move to that. So I have five transitional steps that I think, and this is now I'm going more into essentially a debate with um, the Islamic state arguments that people have advanced about creating an Islamic state. So I think we need to con con conduct or operationalize five conceptual shifts to build a state of Hassan mm. based on the state of Medina. There are two historical precedents in the Muslim history. One is from roughly 621 to 631, 32 AD, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was governing Medina. And then 30 years after his death, when the first four caliphs who are 
designated as Khulfa Rashidin or the rightly guided caliphs who govern. So if you look at all the contemporary calls for establishing an Islamic state or an Islamic caliphate, etc., they privilege following Maududi and to some extent Sayyid Qutb and others, the period of the Khulfa Rashidin of the four caliphs. And so they want to establish a caliphate. Uh, in recent times, somebody like Imran Khan has called for the state of to emulate the first 10 years, the 10 years that precedes the the 30 years of the Khulfa Rashidin when Prophet Muhammad was, was in charge of Medina. So I've been writing about this for more than 20 years now in a debate with Khalid Abdul Fadl in his book, uh, Islam and the Challenge of Democracy. I critique his conception of Islamic democracy by saying it ignores the constitution of Medina on the basis of which Prophet Muhammad governed. So in my book, I have an extensive discussion about the constitution of Medina, etc. But to be very short and quick, uh, I essentially say that we can draw three conclusions from it. One is that Prophet Muhammad governed by consent. So the treaty of, it was like a treaty, an agreement. So everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims, Jews and pagans, and some Christians who lived there, all agreed that the Prophet will govern them. Not because he was a prophet of Islam, but because they wanted him to govern them. They thought he would be the best person to bring about peace among the tribes yeah. there. And so he governed by their consent. Well, he, he, was, he was invited by them, actually, to... Yes, to, exactly. To, they were to come, a community exactly. that was riven and, and conflict, and there were yes. conflicts. Yeah. So they needed someone to come in and bring justice and order and fair governance. So he was invited yes. by them. Yeah. So there are two covenants, actually, right? One before he came and one after he came. So we are talking about the one after he came, which is the covenant of yeah. Latina. So he there governed by consent. Number two... He governed through consultation, Shura Baina, yeah. through consultation with his companions. And the third one is on the basis of the agreement of Medina, which I say is constitutional. So the three C's that I identify, which are critical, are the constitutionality of Medina. So constitutional governance through consent and through consultation, the three C's of the state of Medina. So my argument is that when we think of Islamic states. So number one, we need to move from Tawheed to human sovereignty. People keep talking about Tawheed. Yes, that's the most important verse, the one that's of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la ilaha illallah. But what people claim is that in an Islamic state, God is sovereign. And uh, in a non-Islamic state, God is not sovereign. I, I've never heard anything more ridiculous. Are you telling me that today, what happens in America is not under God's control? Do you think that we have excluded America from God's sovereignty? Now, Zabila, it's impossible. Everything that exists is under God's sovereignty. And by everything, I don't mean just people and countries and planets and universe. So what do we do really? So, so my argument is to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he has given khilafah to human beings. He has given us sovereignty. And on the basis of that in sovereignty, he's going to exercise judgment upon us. So we have to recognize that God is not in charge of Afghanistan, even though it's an Islamic emirate and claims that the number one principle of their governance is Tawid. The Taliban are in charge of America. So if there is bad governance in Afghanistan, if there's a human humanitarian crisis and their government is not able to do everything that is necessary, to take care of it, it is not the failure of God, now it is a failure of the leadership of Afghanistan. And the fact that Norway is doing very well and the fact that Singapore is doing very well is not because that they have excluded God's sovereignty and they are doing a great job of keeping their people happy. It's ridiculous. So I think we have to recognize that there is human agency and human sovereignty, regardless of which even during the Khulfai Rashidin period, if human beings were in charge and they made these decisions and they governed and therefore, we have to hold them as accountable as we do anybody else. So they need to govern by consent. They need to be constrained by constitutionality. Uh, and we also want them to consult us in making policies. Number two, I would like Muslim thinkers who advance political philosophy is to privilege the state of Medina over the 30 years of the era of Khulfai Rashidin. We are 
God has mandated that we follow his Quran and the precedence of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. God has not mandated that we follow the Quran and the precedence of those who follow Prophet Muhammad. Why should we follow the followers when we have the sunnah of the Prophet right there? And in that, there are lots of fundamental things in the constitution of Medina, which today's Taliban type Islamists would back off from. One is treating everybody as equal citizens. There is a verse, there is an article in the constitution of Medina which says that Jews are one ummah with us. The concept of Ummah in think, the constitution of Medina I includes think, both Jews and pagans. I think that this is, a, if I may interrupt, this is actually a, a really interesting point you're making. The, uh, it is obviously right what you're saying. The Ummah, as defined by the constitution of Medina. By the way, uh, you could, there's actually, in my humble opinion, there's a very good article even on Wikipedia about the constitution of Medina. You can Google. Um, and it explains just that. The Ummah is made up of non-Muslims. Um, but the term yep. as is used today doesn't include non-Muslims. So there's been a shift in the definition. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and that is what happens if you move away from the Medina model. And I have a feeling that there are vested, uh, narrow-minded Muslim theologians and scholars who do not have the vision, the compassion, and the love that Prophet Muhammad had for his fellow human beings to include everybody in the Ummah. The word Ummah becomes redundant if everybody is part of the word Ummah. It's just another word for humanity, isn't it? And that's what the Prophet ﷺ basically said, that they are all part of the Ummah because they were part of the constitution of Medina. So today when we live in societies which are multiracial, multireligious, multiethnic, uh, the constitution of Medina is an appropriate example as opposed to anything else. So that's the second suggestion that Muslims need to do is to shift from the caliphal model to the Medina model. And I'm happy that Imran Khan is doing that. There was an article he published just a few, I think less than a, 10 days ago in the, in the Pakistan Tribune in which he talked about how he is trying to establish uh, a, a republic based on, this, on the, the example of Medina. Some people think that it, he's doing that because he's being pushed out by forces that dominate his society. But nevertheless, the third thing that I want to point out is we need to f move away from structure to governance. When you look at Muslim thinkers, even great ones called Al-Farabi and others, they, when they talk about the good society, good government, etc., they are always talking about the structure of the government. Like Americans talk about uh, of uh, checks and balances. These are structural aspects, right? That, oh, the presidency is balanced by the, con by the Congress. But if you look at Trump's presidency and the, the losers who constitute the Republican Party, they, they neutralized the American Constitution. There were no checks and balances. <laughs> the Congress was a cheerleader for the president. They were not fulfilling their constitutional responsibility. So what's the point of having a structure when it is not done? So I think that Muslims tend to focus a lot on the structure. We need to have a khilafa that looks exactly like the one that was established after the death of Prophet Muhammad or something like that. My suggestion is forget the structure of the government. What you need to do is to look at governance. And governance is the delivery of public goods. And good governance is an inclusive delivery of public goods. A system of government or a practice of government is a regime that ensures that people get their public goods uh, and people are safe, people are happy, people are content. So whether you look at Singapore, which is number 75 on democracy, but number one on good governance, or whether you look at Norway, which is one of the best democracies in the world, people are happy because their governance is good. Don't come and say, oh, I'm going to implement the Sharia. At the end of the day, if people are not happy, if people are not good, I know Islamists are going to justify, we are not here to make people happy. We want them to get up and pray five times a day. If they don't, we will whip them. We want them to follow the law. If they don't, we will. This is what God wants. And we are gods on this earth because sovereignty is gods. And we're going to impose this on you, whether you like it or not. Like look at Saudi Arabia for all these decades. It is to force people to pray, force people to do this and that. Now they're backing away from all of that. 
So my point is essentially that it doesn't matter what kind of government you are, democracy, autocracy, Islamic, non-Islamic. At the end of the day, if you cannot provide public goods, it's bad governance. I also want to talk about the opposite side of this point. So, so my number four is a, a critique of my number three. The fourth point is that sometimes in pursuit of national interests, we also undermine good governance. In America, you can do whatever you like by saying freedom. Apparently fighting for freedom. I'm doing this for freedom. I'm going to kill you and cut your throat and bury you for freedom. And apparently that is halal, it's a good thing. Freedom is like a justifier for whatever you want to do. You want to wage wars overseas, et cetera. Defending freedom is like a slogan, meaningless thing. So a lot of uh, undermining of freedom is done in the name of defending freedom, in, at least in, in my country. And it is usually, freedom is, is, is synonymous with national interest. You're basically trying to say, this is in our national interest at the moment, and therefore we would like to do. I want countries to also include national virtue as part of national interest. So it is not important. It is important that America be a powerful country and a very good economy. But the virtue of having a strong economy is that there is equitable distribution of wealth. So the national interest to be a strong economy should be balanced by the national virtue of uh, equitable distribution of justice. Uh, the national interest to be a, a, a strong state should also be balanced by uh, an absence of uh, oppression for minorities and others, uh, gender equality, racial equality, all of these things need to be addressed. So I think that every time we talk about national interest, we should also talk about national virtue, which we do. Like when Biden came, he said, oh, America is back. And I was kind of stunned. And I said, which America is back after Donald Trump? The America that invaded Iraq? Mm. Is that America back? The America which is using drones all over the world. So if you look at America prior to Trump, it's not a great America that anyone would be thrilled to have back. So what does he mean by America is back? I would like him to talk about the values which he's bringing back. So he says, okay, we are bringing back democracy and respect for human rights. So, okay, are you dealing with India and asking them how they are just, treating so, their minorities? How let me just say, just clarify, is, Guant yep. is Guantanamo Bay still open under a Biden presidency? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. I think so Biden shut it rights, down, but Obama... Human rights yeah, are not... So, but, are not Ob yeah. <laughs> No, even nothing has happened since George Floyd happened. The voting rights bill has failed. <laughs> so, so some of the attempts to, to eliminate racial inequity in the country has failed. Uh, I think Biden may have done something about Guantanamo. I don't know that. But I do know that Obama had completely failed to do it. Even that was one of the... He, he promised promises. as well. But, he promised as well to close it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Y yes. So, so there are other promises that he has made uh, that he has failed. And uh, so, so to my, my point is that we should... doesn't matter who the governor is. Just because if, if he... If he's so-called Islamic government or whatever, we need to ask what are national virtues? Are you appreciating the values that we appreciate as a society? Uh, if Islamic countries say, oh, we want to impose Islamic values, well, then ask yourself. You know, when Imran Khan said, I never heard about the Uyghurs, I was quite surprised. Don't they have the internet in Pakistan? He kept denying what was happening to the Uyghurs. So that, then the whole claim of his establishing a state of Medina and all of that just goes down the toilet to me. He's allowing his national interest to dominate. Yes, I know he has to ignore it. China can be very vindictive. More Muslim countries supported China on the Uyghur issue at the UN yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then opposed it. I was very surprised yeah, so much for Islamic strong voices speaking out uh, in support of yeah. uh, the Chinese Muslims. Yeah. Must, uh, very, very striking absence. So, so, so mm. yeah, and the same with Indian Muslims now, or and the complete uh, people have forgotten the Palestinian cause. So the question of national virtue comes there. And finally, there's a lot of talk about justice, justice, justice. Oh, the purpose of the Sharia is to establish justice, etc., which is quite fascinating. Uh, because, like I said, uh, when the Quran says, in Allah, they should say the aspiration should be to establish justice with Ahsan, not just justice to go to begin with. But when they talk about justice, they talk about justice as an individual virtue. 
or a, or something in the system. Oh, we need to have a virtuous caliph. So people were going crazy about the fact that Mursi was someone who memorized the Quran, or Erdogan is one who has such. I don't know if you have ever heard Erdogan recite uh, the Quran. I did. I, I, was in, I was in Istanbul a few months ago, and uh, I saw it on television. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So especially the verses. 190 to 192 from the third chapter of the Quran is just is beautiful. Okay, now that that doesn't mean he's okay. He may be an angel, whatever he is. Okay, uh, oh. Morsi was uh, had memorized the Quran, and you know, Sisi, the current president of Egypt, when he was studying here in Pennsylvania, really, he used to lead the prayers in the Fajr prayer at the mosque. Really? I had no idea. So oh. he. he his khirat is also very good. And when Morsi went to meet with Sisi, it was time for Maghrib, and Sisi led the prayers, and Morsi prayed behind him in his house. Wow. And they talk about how wonderful it was he was praying. So I think all that is fine. What we need to do is when we talk about justice, we don't need to talk about as an individual virtues. We need to talk it about social reality. Yeah, of course. Okay, we need to ask, yes, we need to see whether the policies are, are just and equitable. Uh, so, so this whole discussion of social justice that we are talking about, social justice is not an individual character. Social justice is uh, an assessment of a particular society at a given point of time. And I think that is what the, the fifth transition that we need to make in Islamic discourses and not say, oh, he implemented the Sharia. He decided today that everybody is going to fast in month of Ramadan or they're going to go to jail. No, 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 no. That is not how I want you to judge an Islamic state. I want you to judge an Islamic state by saying, is there discrimination in the society? Is there poverty in the society? Is there inequity in the world? How can there be rich people and very, very poor people in a Muslim society uh, if zakat is one of the pillars of Islam, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So these are the five transitions that I would recommend that Muslim societies contemplate uh, if they want to move towards uh, a state of Islam. So that is my presentation. I think I have taken more than an hour. I plan to do only 20 no, minutes. Uh, 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 quality content is, uh, is, is good. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And I, I was wondering how I might, I, I have read um, the, some of the chapters in your, your book and I've read other material in preparation for our conference, uh, your, for your uh, presence on, on uh, blogging theology. Thank you for that. And um, I came across um, an interesting paper by an academic, a fellow American professor, Muslim professor, uh, Professor Overmere Anjum of the University of Toledo in the United States. And I know you've read the article because we discussed it briefly before we came on air. The article or the paper is an academic paper called Who Wants the Cal- Caliphate? Who Wants the Caliphate? He asks. Now, he's a Muslim as well. And um, I just, if you don't mind, just read a couple of paragraphs on that because um, it, it presents some interesting ideas uh, on this subject of Islamic governance, uh, the nature of it, the necessity of it, from a more traditional point of view. Um, so, if I may, um, this is one paragraph. Uh, it, um, this is all from the article, Who Wants the Caliphate? And he's quite rhetorically powerful in places. He's, he writes, as the real and virtual images of the helplessness of Muslim masses and the betrayal of the Muslim elite circulate and grow, the idea of the Ummah, the global community of Muslims, soars higher and sinks deeper, as does its natural complement, the caliphate, a unified government to care for all Muslims, especially the forgotten ones on the margins. As these margins widen, far outweighing the fewer fewer protected populations of the Muslim lands, the call grows shriller. So he, he sees the caliphate as uh, uh, as uh, like a shield, protecting or uh, advocating a united Muslim community globally. And then secondly, if I may, um, and there's something quite interesting, what does the Quran say about this? And, and in his view, um, the professor says, the Quran the scholars have generally agreed, mentions the direct and indirect obligation for the believing community, that's the community of believers, obviously, to be united under a ruler from among them and contains numerous constitutional, political and legal commandments, rules that can only be implemented in an autonomous Islamic polity, a caliphate, in other words. The significant direct commands like 459, obey those in authority among you. 
was consolidated by innumerable indirect commands and references. For instance, he says, the, impress the imperative to be a distinct community whose members were forbidden to make compromising alliances with outsiders. That's the first example. The second, the command to make war, peace and political treaties as a sovereign community. Thirdly, obeying no other law but God's, hence requiring the community to be legally sovereign. Fourthly, upholding the law in all areas of collective life, including the penal code, marital and social life, commercial and financial regulations, and so on. Finally, a distinct foreign policy, as the prophet upon whom be peace dispatched epistles to the neighboring sovereigns and emperors, which implied the obligation on his successors to follow up on them, in addition to his punitive campaigns against claimants of prophecy, and he mentions them, and other tribes that acted treacherously. And, and so on. All these factors, he says, require beyond doubt that the followers of the prophet form a sovereign political community in control, if not and control, if not monopolize, the means of violence. The aforementioned are historically undisputed, undisputed facts that indicate that his successors merely obeyed his commands and continued his policies. So I think what I rhetorically, the first paragraph, he talks about the helplessness of the Muslim masses and, and the betrayal of the Muslim elites, which you alluded to, I think. As that, as that betrayal and that gulf increases and grows, the idea of the Ummah um, and its caliphate uh, and the complement, the caliphate, um, a unified government to care for all Muslims, this call grows stronger and stronger, he says, as time moves on. So how would you respond to his analysis of, but from the Quran and also from the contemporary political situation uh, that the Muslim, many, many, many Muslims are now calling for this unified Ummah to have a leader who can protect them, but particularly the weakest uh, and the most marginal Muslims who are suffering the most in our present time, it seems. I came prepared to talk about my book. You want me to talk about some no, that, 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 article? No. I, I, well, what I'm doing is I, <laughs> I wonder I'm, what kind of Islamic ethic that is. But anyway, I will answer your question. So he has a problem with the Muslim elite. So he wants to establish a caliphate. One of the rules of the caliphate that people have expounded is that a member of the Quraysh tribe alone can be the caliph. So when we unite the entire Muslim ummah, obviously we will not be allowed to vote, right? Because if we voted an Indonesian or a South Asian as a caliph, he would not be a legitimate caliph because he would not belong to uh, the tribe of Quraysh unless he's some Pakistani or Indian whose last name is Quraysh. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of South Asians with the last name Quraysh claiming to be the tribe from the Quraysh. So that is one issue. Two, good luck. Go ahead, unite the 50 Muslim, 55 Muslim countries and all the hundreds of millions of Muslims who live in diasporas all over the world, bring them together and establish the caliphate. Uh, I'll be happy to apply for a job when that caliphate is established. But there are some premises that he makes, some assumptions that he makes, uh, uh, which I think are misleading. So let me share what they are with you. Uh, I wrote a response to that article of Omer Anjou. If you had told me you wanted to talk about it, I would have highlighted it better. But anyway, so I identify three false premises made by Ovemir Anjum in the article. One, he feels that there is a demand as if the Muslim world is out there demanding the establishment of caliphate. I don't see it. In the Arab Spring, there was a lot of demands, but I didn't hear the population screaming for a caliphate. They wanted dignity. They wanted respect. Uh, yes, in Egypt, uh, and uh, they did elect the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Muslim Brotherhood did not promise a caliphate either. They were promising an Islamic state, which is very different. Islamic state accepts modernity, accepts the very idea of the state, and then tries to Islamize only territory. They didn't say that we will try to strive. 
Oh, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, sir, the, the, vo the, uh, the volume um, is breaking up. Um, One second, can I? Yeah. Sorry, the, we, we appear to have lost the um, volume. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly. You, you were saying, yeah, it was just the last um, 10, 15 seconds that we lost you. Uh, like that what may have happened is uh, that uh, let me just disconnect my... AirPods and just go to the system is quite possible. I may have lost. Uh... So can you hear me now? Oh, very loud and clear. That's even better. <laughs> better than it was a second ago. Yeah. Now that's very crystal. No, it is still sticking. To... No. Mm. One second. So you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Maybe you can't. Can you hear me now? So... Can. can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, good. Good. Uh, okay. Back to, back to the... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so going back to the article, so first of all, he's assuming that there is an overwhelming demand for it. I don't see the demand. There are so many, like I cite few research indications, vast of them want democracies. There were surveys done in, the, in just a few years ago in the Arab world and the Muslim world where nearly 80% of the people demanded democracy. Nobody is wanting unity. Kashmiris want their state. They don't want to join Pakistan or India. Kurds want their state. They are part of the Muslim country. They want to break away. Moros in Philippines, Rohingyas in Myanmar, Palestinians, Uyghurs, all over the world, they are demanding nation state. We can see the demand for a nation state by Muslim minorities all over the world. You have to prove to me that all of these people want the caliphate before I will even believe this assumption that there's a huge demand for caliphate. Of course, every society wants security. Every society wants good governance. That's why they voted for Imran Khan in Pakistan and Erdogan in, in Turkey. But the Turks are not going to merge with Syria. They're not going to merge with Iraq. Nationalism is more profound. As globalization becomes less and less useful to Western countries, it is going to diminish. It is also triggering uh, authoritarianism and nationalist passions everywhere. So this first assumption there is a fundamental demand is wrong. Yes, the Muslim elite is corrupt. Muslim elite do not act in the interest of the Muslim population. And that is what they want. That's why the Pakistani people went ahead and thought that Imran Khan would provide that kind of governance. And he has failed. But I don't see the Pakistani population rising and saying, we want a caliph and we want to unite with Bangladesh and Indonesia and Malaysia. So this is pure fantasy. I don't know why you would even take that seriously. The second false premise is that nation state is unraveling. I don't think so. <laughs> nation states are becoming a bit more stronger. The whole idea of Brexit from Europe was to strengthen British nationalism. So the whole idea of Brexit is, 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 is the rise of nationalism. You can see rise of nationalism in India. You can see uh, the whole oppression of Uyghurs is because China fears uh, essentially wants to protect China as a nation state, as a border. Mm -hmm. One of the more interesting things that Indian foreign minister made, uh, I reviewed his book recently, you can see it on my channel, Conversation. He says India is in transition because we are transitioning from a civilization to a nation state. That's those are his exact words. So, so if he thinks that the nation state is uh, uh, unraveling and <laughs> the solution is going to come up, uh, good luck. And if those people who want to believe that, uh, I have uh, a small cottage on Jupiter that I want to sell uh, at a discount. Uh, and I hope you will buy it. Oh, but his third premise, his third premise, this is important. Okay, So you should let me do this. This third premise that the caliphate will automatically imply unity and peace is divorced from any knowledge of history. So, for example, take the Khulufai Rashidin, the best example of the caliphate. The first thing that Abu Bakr, please be upon, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, was Muslims simply rebelled. They refused to pay taxes. They refused to pay zakat. They declared them murtad and went on a civil war against other Muslims. It's called the Ridda Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, Umar's reign was very, very expansionist. But if you look at the periods of Usman and Ali, there was so much of civil wars all around. There were so many wars that within the family of the Prophet, the wife of the prophet against the son-in-law of the prophet. There was no peace. There were civil wars. The Hazrat Ali fought three civil wars in a short duration of six. So what peace, what unity he's talking about, uh, I don't know. You know, so this assumption that automatically there will be peace and unity 
if you have a caliphate is devo- uh, devoid from reality mm-hmm. yes you can like my state asan is, is aspirational his caliphate is also aspirational he can spend the rest of his life aspiring to create one and like i am spending this day to day to to essentially advocate for a state of asan okay well thank you for that i i um sorry to uh bounce that on you i was only only came across this article this afternoon uh, and i thought it'd be interesting to share um a that's all right your islamic sure, sure. colleague from the united states who's also written on precisely the same issue what his thoughts were um professor andrew i'm i'm very happy to say is coming on blogging theology god willing uh soon in the next several weeks uh as well so um uh to talk about um his work so um uh thank you for that um that that's all i have to say really um is there anything in conclusion um you want to uh share with us about further thoughts about your book or or your thoughts on this matter no i i did make the i hope that people will read the book so, some mm-hmm. things cannot be discussed uh, there are, and uh, so people should read the book and uh, i'm fully aware that uh, the that this is an aspirational project most normative projects are aspirational but then sometimes they become real when a certain contingent a large contingent constituency embraces it i'm hoping in my book i describe uh, that one of the things that is essential in a state of afghan is what i call as a society of muhsins so a group of people which uh, who will advocate uh, for afghan in public policy and in governance uh, and so people who will go out and say i understand that this policy may not be pragmatic and this policy may be very difficult to interpret uh, but uh, i would like to articulate very specifically that this is perhaps the best way to address this particular situation this particular challenge and we have lots of challenges uh, both locally globally so for example what would be the most beautiful way to deal with covid mm-hmm. what would be the asan solution to covid right one way to do would be to pool the scientific and other resources of all countries mm, mm, mm. and distribute vaccinations and treatments equitably across the planet and i can guarantee you if if we are able to distribute it that way then this this the variants will disappear the variants come from inequity right some societies are heavily vaccinated fine those mm. societies which are not variants may emerge there and then so so that is what i want to do i want to see someone come out and say look uh, this is uh, idealistic but the best way to deal with uh, with this particular scenario is to articulate a position i know it will it's not going to happen there is a, a movie that came out very recently about uh, and for uh, uh, don't look up it's called don't look up uh, uh, on amazon or netflix it's talking about how an asteroid or, or a meteor is about to strike the earth <laughs> don't look up uh, okay. and <laughs> and don't look up because you can actually see it coming and the president so it's it's also a critique on america so the president says you're anti national if you look up ah uh, if you look up and right. uh, you are an anti national so there is a constituency which wants to deny the reality of uh, of the um, the meteor coming and hitting earth but what was interesting is that this is a global challenge right would would all countries come together then to address it all they needed was to be able to nuke that thing and change the direction uh, in which it was going so 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 we have compelling global challenges such as climate uh, change pandemics uh, uh, rise of authoritarianism and in, in this also you know uh, the the solutions are idealistic uh, and like what ovemir also wants is yes he wants a, a, an islamic state that will protect muslims uh, so we can send armies into china to protect uighurs we can send armies into india to protect uh indian muslims who might be subject to genocide or things like that send an army over so what pakistan is a nuclear state has it done anything to help the palestinians uh in the past whatever 3 4 decades this crisis has gone on no not really so i don't know how we are going to go around selling this idea and on top of that uh to to also have historical flaws the assumption that the caliphate will automatically allow no there were three caliphates at one point 
uh, in, in Islamic history, in my article, I point out three different caliphates yeah. uh, existing at one point. There were many wars fought among Muslims. Uh, I recently looked at the history of Babur, the uh, established the guy who established the Mughal Empire. I found that all his life, all the wars that he fought were not only with Muslims, but with his family members. He fought against his father-in-law, his uncles, his cousins. So, so Muslims have been fighting each other for a long time. So this assumption that someone raises this, uh, you know, the, the Hizbut Tahrir also has this ideology that once he established the Khilafah, all problems were solved. And my question to them is, go back to 1923, when the Khilafah did exist, what problems did it solve? It was not even able to prevent itself from being eliminated. And one final point, and I'm sure this will create a lot of controversy. The Salafi school of thought, and this is probably going to be very controversial, so be alert, Paul. The Salafi school of thought follows a tradition which says that the first three generations of Muslims are the best Muslims. The Salaf Salah. Yeah. yeah. These are the generations who rejected the Khilafah system after 30 years. They removed the Khilafah system and established a monarchy, a hereditary monarchy with Muawiyah, who was a, a companion of the Prophet, the first generation Muslim. And his son, Yazid, who took over later. These were the best Muslims who could not continue with the Khilafah. You expect me and Uwemir Anjum to be able to do that? What the Sahaba and the Tabayin failed? And then they were never able to establish a Khilafah again. Come on, be real. That's what I mean by a dangerous fantasy. Okay. Well, um, thank you um, for that. Now, I have actually read several chapters uh, of your book, and um, uh, I'm happy to say that Isan is not only a, a virtue, if that's the right word, that you are advocating. It's actually the way you write the book as well. The, the book is actually quite beautifully written uh, in terms of its eloquence. Uh, often academic terms can be a little bit dry, um, but um, this is actually a, a well-written, I think, a, a well-written, interesting, beautifully written book, actually, um, uh, with many interesting examples from all, all facets of life and Islamic teaching. So, um, as I said before, I will uh, link to it in the description below so you can get a copy uh, from Amazon as well as your YouTube channel and your Twitter account. So um, if, you, uh, if you're interested in, in um, uh, Professor Khan's views, do get Islam and Good Governance, a political philosophy of Islam. Um, it's a fascinating read. So um, thank you uh, again very much, sir, for your valuable time and your um, eloquence and your expertise on all this. Thank you very much. My last word is from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ahsanu inna Allah yuhibbul mawsinin. Do beautiful things. Allah loves those who do beautiful things. Thank you. That's a very, a very fitting uh, last word. Thank you very much for that.